Hi, everyone. My name is Crystal Ray, and I'm so glad to be here today to share with you something that really changed my life. I had a really devastating car wreck about some 20 some years ago. And before we get started, I just want to say that I love you, that my soul loves your soul. And this is a definitely a divine meeting of the souls. And I'm honored and so privileged to be the one to share this message of unconditional love with you today. So let me start with my childhood. I had a very dysfunctional childhood. My mom was a divorced woman with three children. So she worked several jobs to try and maintain the household. And, you know, she had these three little beings that were looking up to her for love and care, which I can only imagine was so very difficult for her. And she started to drink, I think, as a way of to self-medicate and to numb from all the pain, which with most addictions, as many people have experienced, I mean, it starts to take over your life. And that's exactly what happened with my mom as she became an alcoholic and not a nice alcoholic. She was a very abusive physically, verbally, and otherwise. And it was a really challenging upbringing. One of the first things that happened spiritually for me was happened when I was around between 11 and 13. I can never remember. It's a long time ago. But I remember my drunken mother pounding down the hallway one morning. And whenever this happened, the three of us, you know, something was up. We never knew who it was. But this particular morning, as I was just shivering in my bed with my pajamas, I heard the thundering down the hall. And I didn't know if it was me, but I somehow knew it was. There was this eerie silence that happened right before she came slamming through the door and grabbed me by the hair and pulled me down the hall and kind of just threw me in the kitchen floor and pointed to the ceiling and asked me why I hadn't cleaned the grease spot off the ceiling. With all my other little girl chores, it was a really trying thing to do. I was going to school. I had a baby sister who was 10 years younger who basically I raised and just maintaining the house. I was very young and I was already the adult in the house. So I didn't argue with her. I didn't say anything that, you know, between all, all my other chores, I hadn't gotten to it. I just simply climbed up on the counter and started cleaning. And I remember there is this feeling of being so tired. I was young. I was, you know, my soul felt exhausted. It was just so much for me. I didn't really have any support system and I was just trying to keep my head above the water. And I remember starting a conversation with God and I always make the joke that God in our household was just only welcome if he was condemned. So there wasn't really any religion in our house other than maybe a bit of atheism and agnostic perhaps, but I had still heard all the stories of Jesus, you know, heaven and hell, even at that young age, I could never phantom a God that would make such a place called hell or create us to be imperfect and then literally punish us for our imperfections. So I started having this conversation with God and I said, you know, if you're really God, then I don't know why I can't know you're real like you actually exist before I die. And secondly, and this was probably the bigger request was if you could help my mom stop drinking, I would really believe in you. And with that, I just kept scrubbing the ceiling. And I remember thinking about Christians and being a good person. And I remember thinking, wow, if you have to be good to go to heaven, and that's your only purpose for being good, then that's not really good. Or if you're good to avoid eternal damnation, hell, fire, snakes, all the stuff that I'd heard about as a little girl, then that's also corrupt. I remember thinking, I just want to be good because I'm a good person. And that really woke me up. And I remember feeling like as though the sun burst through the clouds. And I was like, <gasps> it was like my first real experience of self-worth. And I remember thinking, <gasps> that means I am a good person. And it was like, you know, my mom is wrong about me because, you know, I think when people have addictions, they project a lot of negativity on the people around them. In particular, I felt like I was never good enough, smart enough, you know, pretty enough or anything enough for my mom. And as a matter of fact, I felt like everything that she was going through was my fault, that if I didn't exist, that she wouldn't be an alcoholic, that she wouldn't have all this pressure. So this awakening that I just wanted to be good for goodness sake, was quite refreshing. And I remember I was still just rubbing the ceiling and I was so kind of in a blissful trance that I turned around and I literally walked off this counter. And here's where it gets juicy. I started to fall through time and space. Like my head, if you walk off a counter, it's kind of like stepping into an empty swimming pool. The physics of it is your head starts to fall down. And so as my head started hurling towards the ground, time slowed down. 
And I was aware of three of me, the body that was falling through time and space, the entity that lived within the body, and also the all-knowing observer that was also me, that was very dispassionate about the whole event. I didn't relate with the body or the dispassionate observer, but I completely related with what I will call the soul essence that was alive within the body of that little girl. And from a distance, I was watching myself falling, and it was, as I said, time slowed down. And it was though I was in a whirling time and space, like a tornado. And I was falling through the middle of this tornado, or this tornado was going up, but there was no sound. It was just this whirling time and space. And I was kind of in a fetal position. And I was also above myself at a short distance watching the whole thing. Suddenly I arrived into this serene black night. And it was like a warm, comforting blanket. And in the distance, it was punctuated with radiant lights. And these lights, there was a voice that boomed within me and around me, not necessarily a telepathic voice, but just a sort of knowing that was bestowed upon me that told me that this is time and space. And those lights out in the distance are stars. And that's what you are. And boom, with that, I was back in my body. And like a cat, I had magically landed on my feet. So when I came to some sort of consciousness, I was surprised, number one, to be on my feet. So, you know, you try to make some kind of sense of things that happen that don't make sense. I assumed that I must have fallen had this really cool dream, hit my head. So I ran to the bathroom to see if I had any sort of bruise or bleeding or bump or something. You don't just slam into the floor from about four to five feet up head on and not have a bruise. But surprisingly, I had nothing. There's a lot more to that story, but for this short interview, I won't add on. I just wanted to give you some context so that I can tell you about my near-death experience that happened on February 23rd, 1997. And this was a devastating car wreck. Shortly after I had gotten divorced, not even that shortly really, it was like a year and a half after I got divorced, I had been invited out to a, a mountain house, a ski adventure with a gentleman, which I wasn't really ready to date. So I brought my cousin Carmen with me, who was my witness. She was, I guess, my chaperone at the time. And we went on this ski trip with him and his family. And we weren't having the best time. It wasn't the best match and I think I wasn't ready so we were heading back early I remember asking Carmen are you ready to go back and she's like yes I'm ready and so we started heading back toward the airport and we were driving back to the airport somehow we took a mist road and we were going up a mountain instead of going down but anyway we were going up this mountain heading toward the airport when he suddenly lost control of the car and the car started to spin around on these icy mountain roads and he was you know doing all this stuff car Carmen was in the back seat screaming, and there was this sudden calm that came over me. Even as I saw the speeding car coming down the mountain that really impacted my side of the Jeep, it was a small red Jeep, full force. And I was in this very zen-like state, as though time again had slowed down. And I was again at a distance watching the whole scene as though I were a spectator of my own existence, a witness of of my own life. I found myself outside of the Jeep in the luminous presence of a divine being. I say being, but it was really more of a presence. And I was completely cradled and comforted as I watched the car, the small red Jeep spin around, be hit at that fast rate of impact, fly off of a cliff that by the way was 80 feet down, hit the ground at about 25 feet and then flip 10 times. And I remember during the time that this was happening, there was multiple realities happening for me. There was the body and the experience that was happening within the car being hit and being thrown off a cliff and flipping. And there was also the reality of me watching from above being cradled and comforted in the presence of this luminous light by this radiant being who was again communicating with me but not with words and not even I would I don't even think telepathic would be a great way to say it, it was more like an instant knowing or a download where I was given information instantaneously first thing that I was shown by this radiant being was that I had never really appreciated my own life I remember thinking as the car got hit and went off the cliff like whoa 
I didn't know I was going to die today. I think we somehow as humans have this experience of maybe unconscious, conscious experience of thinking that we are an immortal, but we will all have that day where we will meet our maker. And I was like so surprised. And I remember this great sadness that came over me because I had two small children. And I understood by what I was being shown by this radiant being that life is such a gift that I had never truly experienced the gift of it. I was shown three very poignant things in the space of the time when I was hit in the time that we slammed into the wall of ice at the bottom of that 80-foot cliff. I was shown, number one, very surprising things, by the way, that I had never truly seen the sun rise or set over the horizon or fully understood the gift of a human life and the poignantness of a beginning and the ending of a day and how each day was a gift. And so I remember seeing as though it was as though I were the sun myself. I coming up over the horizon and as though I were the sun myself, setting into the warm comfort of the night and of rest and recuperation. And I was really sad because my life had really been since I was a child about being responsible, about being good, about doing the right thing, about being a good daughter, a good mother, a good wife, a good ex-wife, a good friend, um, all the things. But it was more like a heavy backpack rather than any joy. And I was told distinctly and directly and actually told to share this message with the world, few messages, but this was, I was told distinctly in this instant that each soul is here for the bliss of its own existence. And that includes you, Crystal. And I was so shocked, like bliss, joy, that's why we're here. That moment shown like the fragrance of freshly cut grass and the privilege of having our senses and to be a human embodiment with sight and sound and taste and the ability to smell freshly cut grass, or as the old saying goes, to smell the roses. And I had done none of that in my busyness. And I think this mirrors many of us in our modern world to, you know, get my groceries done and take my kids to school and find my way through the maze of everyday existence. I had overlooked the intrinsic beauty of my own life, of seeing the sun rise and set and to smell the freshly cut grass. And finally, I was shown in this moment that I had never truly embraced another or touched another. And of course, I mean, I had two children and I had combed their hair and sent them to school and cradled them and nursed them and all the things. And I, of course, I had taught people, but the way I was being shown was so different. It was like I had never made, truly made contact. And I was shown that when we embrace each other, that there is an exchange of energy and love and healing and light and the privilege of having these beautiful physical expressions of beingness where we can actually embrace each other. So with that, those three poignant things, I remember thinking, oh, well, it's too late for me because, I mean, I was hurling towards the ground, which was coming quite quickly towards towards me and towards what I believed to be my final day on planet Earth. And with that, I was transported to a space where I saw my life in a three-dimensional panoramic view of every instant of my life and the ripple effect. And in this instance, and still in this luminous, cradled, comforting space, I was shown my every good and bad deed, thought, and action. And there was absolutely no judgment, but the judgment that I brought upon myself. To the contrary, I mean, truthfully, there was just a lot of compassion for me for any judgment or shame or guilt that I might have about my actions. I was lovingly shown those kind moments, which, you know, I think is one of the most surprising things, I think, from a near-death experience is that we're not shown the things that typically are marked as success in our life. For example, you know, success in a career or economics or financial success or success as in getting accolades like an award or a plaque on the wall or a diploma or even being famous or any of the things that we might consider to be success in our terms this was not what I was shown is my success. What I was shown was random acts of kindness where I actually cared for another, did a benevolent act with no need of reciprocation, just wanting to help another from the goodness of my heart. And I was shown particular instances where I had done benevolent acts and randomly helped strangers and helped those who needed my love and attention, even if they had betrayed me or hurt me, such as my mother or 
or a friend or someone and I still cared about them and I still tried to be a force of goodness even though I had been really hurt by their actions I found the grace within me to forgive them so at the end of this unfoldment and as I experienced these rippling effects not only as an observer but as the other person and on and on to ad infinitum I understood the profundity of our each thought and action and I knew how important it was to root our actions thoughts and deeds in in love and a question that I ask now, even when I'm in the most challenging and difficult circumstances of my life, which another thing I'd like to add, just because we've had a near-death experience or a spiritually transformative experience, doesn't mean that we are never to have a dark night of the soul again or be tested. In fact, the contrary is most likely true because we have opened up the door to a deeper understanding of life. We are challenged quite frequently to live the life that we profess that we want. And the question that I ask always is, is this my most loving response to this person, to this place, or to this thing? And sometimes it is, and truthfully, sometimes it is not. And But all we can do is our best until we can do better. So there was this grace that I was given and shown. And I remember this being of light communicating to me that I had many possible destinies available to me, what I would call timelines. And one of these timelines, I would leave the planet. And as I was shown these, or downloaded, let's say just an instant download of these timelines. And, and remember, this is all happening within the span and space of falling from being hurled off of a cliff and heading towards a wall of ice at the bottom of the mountain. But I was shown that one of my life paths available was to absolutely leave the planet to die. And I was shown that if I chose this, I remember thinking, oh no, I can't do that because of my children. My children need me. They're going to be orphaned. And instantly with that thought, I was shown that my children would be just fine without me, which was quite surprising, by the way. Somehow, as mothers, we always believe that the destiny of our children is intricately connected to us. In many ways, it is, but ultimately, each soul has to make their own decisions. And I was shown that my children would be just fine, that they were, I even saw them at my funeral. I saw them meeting significant others, getting married, you know, having their life experiences just fine without me. I saw the entirety of their life. I had other destinies available as well, where I could have come back with some disabilities and it would have been a completely different life. And then the one live stream that I was shown that I really got excited about was the one I'm on right now, where I would be sitting here in a podcast and speaking to you. And I recently wrote the book that this being of life told me you will write a book and tell the world that love is all that matters. And I know this is a message that's been told many, many times, but the way that I like to share this message is that this love is not a romantic kind of love. This love is not even a parental kind of love. It's far beyond anything that any human concept could even encapsulate. It is this all-encompassing love that includes all shadow and all light into the fire of love, and there is no opposite to this love. And that's the love that I'm talking about that matters. So I was shown this that I would be invited to write this book and this would be one reality and I was excited about that I said yes that's what I will do that's what I want to do I want to tell the world that love is all that matters and with that boom I was like hurling in this car wreck again I was inside my body and I remember we we're flipping in the darkness and flipping flipping and I think I went unconscious because when I came back to consciousness I was at the bottom of the mountain I guess we had fell off the ledge or were hurled off the ledge and then we hit at about 25 feet and then we flipped until we landed 80 feet at the bottom of this mountain. So the Jeep was upside down. I remember when I came to consciousness, this is when it gets kind of interesting and really kind of crazy, but I want to share it with you because I think it's important that you know this part of the story. So I remember being so elated that I was alive and kind of surprised and a little bit sad because the last thing I remember saying to this being of light is, oh, well, I guess I'm going into the light. I thought, well, my life is over. There's no possibility for me to to write this book or to come back. And somehow I was hurled back into this body. And I was really excited about waking up and I suddenly had fear like, oh my God, this Jeep is going to explode. Because I remember smelling gasoline and I saw the wheels spinning and there was a wall of ice. I called out for my cousin, no response. The guy who was driving 
was covered in blood, but he said he was fine. So I crawled out this window, climbed up this mountain. Nobody could believe it. I mean, that I even made it up the mountain. I'm not a mountain climber for sure. I'm kind of a girly girl as a matter of fact. But I climbed up this mountain, icy mountain, and everybody was like, do you know what happened down there? And I said, yes, there's two more people. You need to get down there. And then all of a sudden, and this is the kind of eerie and, and crazy part, is I started to feel everyone's feelings and, and know what they were thinking and to feel what they were. And I started to see little movies of the future, like projected in the future. For example, I saw somebody with rubber boots, a man that was running down to the car wreck, stealing my purse and my tickets and my wallet, which I needed to get home to see my children. So I was kind of hysterical. And I remember just yelling out for someone, can you please get my purse? Can you give me? Of course they never did. But they pulled my cousin up in a stretcher, unconscious, and they got the guy driving out as well. I'm not sure exactly how I got to the hospital because I'm pretty sure it was an ambulance, but I mean, everything is a blur. It was in shock, I think, especially since everybody, if anybody touched me, I feel all their feelings and know all their thoughts. So I was like really in shock, like what had just happened? It was freezing, it was cold, and I was having all these out-of-body experiences and, and knowing everybody's feelings and their thoughts. Well, we got to the hospital and they pulled me in. I'm not sure how I got in, but I remember him grabbing my arm and it was a male nurse and he said, something to the effect you guys were drinking and your cousin's going to die. And I'm like, what? What are you talking about? I don't even drink. And the person driving the car did not have more than a glass of wine. Like we were not drinking. He's like, well, you were doing drugs. I'm like, we didn't did nothing. And I just pulled away and I saw Carmen in one of the little rooms on a stretcher and she was still out and there was a bunch of people around. And I kind of pushed my way in and then I just put my hand on her and I felt this bolt of energy, almost like lightning, go through the crown of my head, ripple through my body, through my hands and I saw her body literally just kind of like ripple and it was an instant knowing like oh she's going to be okay and like there was this calm that came over me like serene peace as though the waves on the ocean had suddenly just silenced and there was just this absolute peace and so with that the nurse grabbed my arm and said you can't be in here and when he did I saw a movie like a, a little clip of him beating I think his wife or girlfriend or something the night before and I was like horrified I was like let go of me and I went running to the bathroom and I just got into a corner. I was just like, nobody touched me, nobody talked to me and I, I was just shaking. And a really nice nurse came in. She said, you know, we need to get some x-rays. Can I help you out of here? She put a blanket around me. And I said, I'll come as long as that nurse doesn't get close to me. She said, no, no, he's not gonna get close to you. And they took me and again, it gets kind of groovy here. They took an x-ray of my neck. And when they came back, they said, well, we have some bad news for you. He said, your neck is broken. And I'm like, oh no. <laughs> I was like, that can't be. I said, that's not part of my life review. Because I remember with this being, this presence telling me that I was going to come back, the story that he shared with me did not include a broken neck. I was like, no, 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 no. That's not part of my life story. And I remember putting my hand on my neck. And when I did, I felt that same heat going through my own hand into my neck. And I was like glued to my neck. And I said, no, no, you need to take another x-ray. And so they took x-ray number two. They took x-ray number three. And on the fourth one, they said, we don't know what's going on. And they showed me clearly there was a break in my neck on number one, but on number four and three and two, there was no break in my neck. So I finally signed away my rights. They made me sign away my rights saying, you know, we're not responsible if your neck is broken. So I got out and fast forward a couple of weeks, I made it back to my home and I just kind of locked myself in a room because it was such a scary time for me because I wasn't truly a girl that had experiences with supernatural things or psychic things. And suddenly I was seeing auras. I didn't even know what an aura was, by the way. I was feeling people's thoughts. I mean, literally feeling them as though it were me. And if it was anger or fear. And what I was really shocked to find is there's so much fear and shame inside of people. And it was just really hard to ground that energy and to feel it. I mean, it just made me want to cry every time I was around people. But about two weeks out from the accident, I went to see Carmen. And I remember when I went to see her, when I walked in the room, I was really surprised because she was in the back seat and she had hit her head here and she hit her head there and she truthfully had the most injuries although I couldn't turn my neck. I mean, I, I had to go through a year of chiropractic just to turn my neck. It wasn't broken, but it was definitely severe whiplash. And, but she was, every bone in her face was broken, including her eye sockets. And so she had rubber bands on her teeth. Her eyes were swollen. I mean, she did not look like the beautiful, radiant woman that I knew. And so it scared me. And when I saw her, I was like, and then I told myself, 
Crystal, this is your cousin, Carmen, and you love her. And so I walked over and I, again, there was doctors and nurses and her mother and her father and sister, I'm not sure who all was in there, but I could feel like the collective anger towards me. Like they had blamed me because I invited her on this trip and this horrible thing had happened to her. And I remember just feeling how they were so uncomfortable having me even in the room. They couldn't even look at me. They were so angry, even though I wasn't the one driving. And, and of course it wasn't anyone's fault. It was icy roads and it could have happened, but I understood at the same time, it felt very uncomfortable for me. But I walked over to Carmen, who was in a coma still, and this is where it gets really interesting again. And I put my hand on her, and she immediately opened her eyes, and which surprised the doctors, the nurses, her mother, and everyone else. They were all kind of in a state of shock. And she managed with her little IV to wobble over to me, and she told me, Crystal, I'm in the light. I've never been so radiant. I'm a star. And I was like, because when I was a little girl, the story I shared with you earlier, and I had fallen off the counter, and I was shown that the lights punctuating the night were stars, and that's what we are. And this was God's way, or the universe's way, or the divine message from my soul to validate that there was something really mystical and mysterious and quite wonderful happening in the universe. So I knew exactly what she meant when she said, we are stars. And I remember her mom going, rolling her eyes and saying, brain damage. And then Carmen went back to bed and immediately went back into coma. So I guess a couple of times of this happening, her mother got really scared and with her religious belief thought that I was doing some kind of poltergeist or something. I'm not sure exactly what she believed, but I was uninvited to see Carmen anymore. They told me not to come and visit, that they wouldn't open the door and that they didn't want my presence there, which was really sad. And I lost contact with her for many years until of recent, by the way, which is a really lovely reunion that we had. And her life turned out, by the way, just fine. She had a miraculous recovery, which nobody can explain, not even her doctors. There is grace in the universe. And, and so she was completely recovered and uh, she went on to be the lead clarinetist for the Dallas Opera and then eventually retired and has her own real estate company and met the love of her life and is living quite happily. So closing down, I mean, I always get questions about, are you still able to feel people's thoughts and know their feelings? And, you know, when you touch people, are they healed? And the answer to all these questions is, first of all, let's address the first one. The first one is that we are all empathetic beings. It's just levels. I learned how to close that door because I felt like it wasn't something that I wanted. It felt invasive to me. And so, yes, I can do that if I want, but I don't, I choose not to do that. I close that door purposely because I don't want to invade someone's personal space. And as far as healing someone by touching them, even healing myself, that wasn't, that was, I felt like I was a conduit to this healing that so this energy moved through me. And I think we all are conduits to healing. Our presence will be either a healing force or it will be the opposite of that, a vortex of negativity that has a negative effect. So I think as we keep our consciousness more enlightened and more loving, let's just put it in, in more real terms, as we choose love over fear and we choose to do the thing that would be the kindest and the most graceful, then what happens is that our presence becomes a healing force. I don't reach out and touch people and feel energy moving through my body. That I do not do. I'm not saying it would never happen again. I'm just saying that doesn't happen. That was a gift that was given to me because I think my timeline was so closely linked with having a broken neck that I kind of flipped over to that and then flipped back because we have so many timelines. I can't even tell you the number of timelines we have based on every little thought and action we might think is insignificant, but literally shifts the rest of our lives. And so there's this thing called the butterfly effect where a butterfly flaps its wings in Brazil and creates a tsunami. And that's the power of our every thought and action. So I know that for me, once I realized the immense power that we have as human beings to impact not only our own lives, but the rippling effect of others and even out into the wider universe and even back into the origin of our source, back to God, I remember thinking how frightening it was and how to know what to do. And I was instantly answered that question by saying, do that which brings you the most joy, even if it's challenging. And joy is an expression of vibrancy. Like you just know you're doing the right thing. So from a simple thing of like pink lipstick or red lipstick, like what feels the most joyous is what I will ask myself. Or should I eat this or should I not do this? Or should I make this phone call or not? 
Should I take this job or not? And I just allow myself to feel it viscerally in my body. So the gifts that I have received from this near death experience have rippled out into my life into ways that I can't even express. But the most important thing that I learned from this is the power of love and the power that we have to change the world with our every thought and action. So with that, I hope you choose love. I hope you know how much I love you. And thank you for listening.